This is Reality Jukebox. Hello, welcome to Reality Jukebox. With me today, George Jones and uh, myself, Ross Lando. Um, We're going to be doing various uh, topics on every podcast. A lot of them are going to be centred around music and what we hope to do is to uh, engage and entertain. We're going to tackle um, some normal subjects but with a different angle and um, the first one that we're going to use today is this gentleman here. The man himself. Certainly is. Elvis Presley. Elvis centred the building. Exactly (laughs) and the the, the thing that we're going to do with Elvis and the different thing we're going to do with Elvis today is what we're basically going to talk about is um, what songs would Elvis have recorded um, if he hadn't have uh, tragically died? So in the 1980s, 1990s, um, or even in the millennium, what songs would have he, re, uh, he recorded? What we'll do is um, there will be a Twitter feed put up as well. Um, we're also going to have um, a competition, which we'll talk about at the end, where any of you Elvis impersonators can upload your favourite you doing your favourite track that you think Elvis should have recorded. Um, And basically, it has to be after um, August 1977, basically. Um, If it's before then, we won't be able to include it, unfortunately. So that's the way we're going to do it. But um, really, um, Elvis still has a complete fascination with people. Um, The iconic image... um, Whichever era it was, everybody has their favourite era of Elvis. Myself, personally, I loved Elvis. Not my favourite artist of all time, but I have to acknowledge what uh, an important um, artist he was within um, the industry that that he came from and what he did and what he created. Um, And there was ups and downs in his careers, as we all know. But as I say, we're going to do something which is slightly different than what we're going to talk about. And um, we'd like you to engage at some point, as I was saying, with with your own tracks or whatever. But, um, George, what was your first sort of introduction to Elvis? The man himself? Yeah. Okay, so growing up, um, I must confess, I didn't know a whole lot about Elvis. Uh, for me, him and Johnny Bravo were two of the same character. Um, it was more the iconography, the big hair, the accent, the jumpsuits. Um, shamefully, when I was at a, uh, a family party years and years ago, uh, they had hired an Elvis impersonator, my great auntie and uncle, but they love Elvis. They'd hired, a, they'd hired an impersonator. Um, I saw Elvis walk in. In my confused young state, I shouted, oh my God, it's Michael Jackson. <laughs> and uh, my family haven't let, me, uh, haven't let me live it down since. Um, so I have since learned that they're two different people. Elvis is the king. Uh, but for me, like I said, it was more of the iconography, the big hair and the jumpsuits. Um, and when I was younger, I saw one of his Vegas specials. Um, and I remember as a drummer, just watching the drummer, I was absolutely killing it. And he was doing some crazy drum fills. And Elvis was on there doing his kind of cry sort of chops on stage. And uh, so I haven't really got as maybe in-depth knowledge, but now I've read up on him and researched him, I really appreciate him because he was kind of, you know, the first American dream, essentially, from rags to riches from, you know, poor old Mississippi in a Tupelo or Tupelo, depending how you say it, to his time in Memphis to becoming the king in the Graceland. Um, so I kind of appreciate that story of coming from nothing to then becoming, you know, the first kind of rock and roll star. It's interesting because there was, um, before I, I, I talk about um, how I got introduced to Elvis, there was, as I would imagine it's well gone now, there used to be down the old Kent Road in South East London, there was a Chinese restaurant Cantonese restaurant called Gracelands and the owner manager used to do he was an Elvis impersonator and he had a karaoke machine in there and about you'd always get a late drink in there as well as well Mm -hmm. as a late meal so you go in there on a Friday evening it'd be 11 o'clock at night or whatever you'd get fed and it's only about 11 30 ladies and gentlemen Elvis Presley and he'd be, he'd be Elvis, this guy. It was just absolutely great. <laughs> go and get your meal and then a bit of Elvis sing A bit song. of Elvis, exactly, <laughs> yeah. But I go back a bit further than that. It was my um, my nan, my grandmother. Um, she lived in East London and um, my mum used to lead me around there. And um, she had in her front room, um, or in a sitting room, mm-hmm. 
this radiogram, which was probably half the size of the room. I can still picture it now. Um, we'll bring a picture up for you. And um, she used to scoop me up. I couldn't have been in the old in three or four. And she used to put Elvis on. And that was really my first sort of introduction to Elvis. Um, and probably one of the first pieces of music that I was ever introduced to. And I started going back backwards and forwards to Elvis, you know, originally you know, as a musician, you know, still am, and then producing. And you sort of sometimes go back to the certain areas, eras that, uh, that Elvis released music. Um, and we all have our favourite era. Um, mine in particular was the sort of uh, 68 to sort of 72 era, mm -hmm. uh, where he had um, James Burton, uh, you know, playing guitar, Mm. The exact band you're talking yeah. about, um, and the great bass player, which uh, was a huge influence, you know. But uh, my nan didn't play those records from that era. She did have "Burning Love," I remember. Nice. Um, yeah, absolutely. But she also had some of the older songs as well. "One Night with You," I remember. I was like a three-year-old. I mean, God knows how long she had those those singles mm -hmm. knocking around. But it was this radiogram. It had such a great sound. Yeah. Um, and that probably really turned me on, yeah. you know, to music. It was just the sound. It had a radio in it as well. Mm -hmm. And it was just like this big clunky bit of furniture. She did have an old black and white television. I remember my granddad at the time, he had like this kind of um, um, ritual when he came in from work. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget where they didn't have an aerial, um, like a like a roof aerial. Yep. They had one of those antennae things. Oh, and he used to come home every yeah. night, switch the television on bloody thing doesn't work like that it it's going to be rolling yeah exactly but it was elvis you mm -hmm. know uh, I, I don't know what kind of music he was into um yeah he unfortunately went a, lo a long time before my nan but yeah. it was my nan you know she was a real music person she used to sing mm -hmm. around her, her masonette uh when she was doing the house and she also um when she used to take me out in a, in a boy called buggy now like out in the thing or whatever there was a record shop called Paul's for Music, which is in Cambridge Heath Road, which I used to visit years later, which was a chart return shop. And um, she'd buy all her records from there. So it, if it wasn't Elvis, it was somebody else. So that was probably my first recollection. And really it was Elvis uh, where that came in. So really, question. yeah. Uh, did your nan catch the 68 uh, Aloha from Hawaii, that kind of broadcast, the multicast? Or well, I, I, I would think during that era, that, that era, there would have been, um, I think there was, there would have been three television channels, BBC One, BBC Two, uh, and ITV. Mm -hmm. There wasn't, you know, there wasn't anything. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that was broadcast. I would imagine that it was. Um, I think it was like a, I think it was like a simulcast, maybe cinemas potentially. I think there were certain theatres that were showing She would have gone to see it. Yeah. She definitely would have gone to see it. I mean, I have a copy of it now. Uh, myself it's absolutely outstanding yeah um it's amazing when you think of it the first sort of solo act to, to do a, you know a broadcast of a concert you know from america obviously there was the issues of, of why he was doing it in the first place and not traveling to you know across the world himself but in terms of a, a you know piece of history and a real kind of a breakthrough really um it's very innovative at the time um and a very clever piece of business by Tom Parker. Well, he went through a very difficult period. He made all those films. He earned the 60s, a yeah. lot of money, which his manager got him to do. But he sort of disappeared, you know, as far as not popularity, but credibility sort of disappeared mm -hmm. uh, when you read up about it and you look about it. And that was the the way he came back because he. I, I think when you watch that, it's sort of, I can really do it. Um, interestingly enough, there's the... Um, there's, there's the track. There's the track that he does on that. I think it might be the um, it might be the opening, which is uh, which was used in the World Cup in 2002 FIFA World Cup. Mm -hmm. um, title. It yep. was a remix. Okay. And um, again, this is where we come on to um, other people. You know, which songs would he have done? Because we'll explain here as well. Um, we we'll say allegedly as well, but. Um, the story actually comes from the singer, writer, guitar player, um, philanthropist, um, Dolly Parton. And Dolly Parton was approached by Elvis's manager in the early 70s. Um, Elvis would like to record um, the huge song, I Will Always Love You. And what would used to happen was that if Elvis actually released your song, a studio recording of your song, um, they would take part of the publishing or control part of the publishing. And she said no. 
Um, and then years later, Whitney Houston did the song. Mm-hmm. Apparently, they say there is a demo knocking around of Elvis doing I Will Always mm-hmm. Love You. Never heard it. It's probably one of those things, does it exist or not? It's like the Robert Johnson, you know, magic extra song <laughs> that was supposed to have been recorded no one's ever heard. Yeah. I don't... We. Both of us wouldn't know that. Uh, the two of us here wouldn't know that. But it brings on to, especially in the 80s and even possibly after his manager's death, if he would have stayed alive, what songs would he have recorded? And I suppose if you sort of start off with the 1980s, probably two of the most prolific artists and songwriters uh, was Bruce Springsteen. A lot of people covered Bruce Springsteen. So you had sort of things like this, which was... Um, uh, the Pointer Sisters, uh, great track, Fire, Bruce Springsteen's song. Nice. Would Elvis have covered that? Well, actually, when you listen to it, it's quite feasible that um, he could have done it. Would he collaborated with Bruce Springsteen? Would he have been on one of his albums? You know, it's Bruce Springsteen's been known to be on other people's albums. Would he have appeared um, if he would have had a different management company or whatever? Um, and then there's someone like Prince. Would Elvis had done a version of Kiss before Tom Jones. Don't know. Would have done a great version of it. Absolutely fantastic version. Yeah. And him and Tom Jones, I think, you know, Elvis was obviously aware and had a lot of respect for Tom. I think they met at some point. Um, very much kind of similar, sort of big style. I think those two in, in a studio together collaborating, the engineer would have had a nightmare because there might have been a real risk of blowing some microphones for level, you know, particularly with Tom and Elvis together. Um and maybe, you know, managing the egos in the room might have been interesting as well. So the question is, is um, there's been a lot of stuff that's come out. There is um, the King album, uh, which came out in the early millennium, mm-hmm. um, which was uh, Gravel Lands, uh, which spawned a couple of hit singles. And there was all sorts of um, covers on there. But that was like 70s as well. So it's things like the sweet blockbuster is on there. But he also there's also an Elvis impersonation of Come As You Are, which we'll put the link up for you. We can't, uh, copyright-wise, we can't put it up now, but we'll certainly give you a link to where, you know, you can listen to it or watch it or whatever. And it's a pretty fine version. It does give you an insight into maybe what kind of stuff he could have done, you know, and gone on to do. Yeah, well, there's also... Uh Elvana, Elvis front in Nirvana, which is a whole act to a guy dressed as Elvis sing, singing kind of the Nevermind album plus other Nirvana songs. Um, I've seen a few clips online. Uh, it's interesting, let's say. Um, maybe it's not as elvis as I thought, potentially, but uh, it's a guy in an Elvis costume at least singing Nirvana songs. You know, w- would Elvis have ad- adapted to the grunge era in, like, in the late 90s, you know, the 90s, early 90s? Um, I, he, probably could, <laughs> he, probably, he probably could have adapted to anyone because... Um, he could sing the phone book. What they used to say, the old saying, he could sing the phone book. Yeah. You know, phone book used to be like that. It wasn't like... Yellow you know, pages. Yeah, having your contacts on your phone now, you yeah. know, whatever. Um, and you could just probably open up and just sing it. You yeah. know, it would be that easy, you know, to do that. Yeah. So, really, um, the world is our oyster to think of some songs and for you as well, you know, to sort of come up with some stuff. There's also could be some very funny stuff. I mean, I... I the, Things just come into my head all the time. The one that's just come into my head now is "You Spin Me Round" by Dead or Alive. <laughs> you know that I mean, you know, Elvis doing that. You know, gold. Which, it would. It would be absolute gold. Um, remember, sometimes these things don't work. But we may be throwing you some ideas as well, mm-hmm. because what we'll do is w- w- when you um, send your stuff in, we'll give you details of how to do it um, at the end of this first podcast. Um, it will give you some ideas, and we obviously want, we just don't want the normal Elvis impersonators. We'd like um, um, female Elvis impersonators, LBGTQ as well. Um, anybody, really. Uh, but it's the originality of how good, um, you know, the idea would be. And we'll announce during the series, this first season, of we'll get you in, but we'll announce what we're going to do. And it's really, what we've got worked out is really a lot of fun mm-hmm. um, on how we do that. Big so, plans. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah we, we'll just, you know, we, exactly. We, you know, we, you know we, we'll, we'll do something like that. So he really basically, you know, I think that he could definitely 
um, sing the phone book. You know, yeah. I mean, there, would you agree with that? Oh, fully. I think when you see you know, the vast range he had, you know, he could sing ballads, he could sing spirituals, as he called them. He can sing pop, he sung rock and roll. I think he was really versatile. Um, and at the time, it was quite a unique breath of fresh air because his generation didn't really have the idol to look up to. The parents' music from the kind of post-war stuff didn't have the edge that the teenagers wanted. Um, and there was a whole issue of segregation and race and, you know, who's singing what style of music. And, um, you know, the kind of people, like, there was, you know, the whites and the black kind of separation. And Elvis kind of bridged that gap. Whether it was for monetization, because of Sam Phillips, as I always said, he wanted a white person that could sing, you know, black music. Yeah. But then in terms of what that did for the youth, you know, it was a real, like, that first moment of, of hysteria. He could go on stage and shake his leg. And then you know the, the girls go mental, and you'd, you'd see him look look at look at Bill on stage or, or, or Scotty, and he was like he found it funny. So then he'd do it again, and you'd see him look to the guys because it was like they couldn't believe the initial reactions to start with. And then, like you said, he could sing anything from those early days of you know the rockabilly stuff to the rock and roll to his bigger ballads to the spirituals he always came back to. I don't doubt he would he could have evolved throughout the years and kind of maybe you know could, could we see Elvis now on a club track? I I, I know there was that remix of um. Uh, come on baby I'm tired of talking yeah, yeah. that come out was massive um, but who knows how far that would have gone it's true it's also would he have collaborated um, mm. with any hip hop artists that's the that, that, that's the other interesting it's easy to sample Elvis I mean, but would he have collaborated with anyone would Dre have produced an Elvis album Dre and Elvis yeah I mean you look at producers how many producers they probably everybody would have probably with a mm. voice like that probably would have wanted um or would queue up? Uh, I would certainly queue. You know, you know, it's just a golden voice. Yeah. Um, and the one thing was was that when uh, before he died, the one thing that never, though his body gave up, the one thing that didn't give up on him was his voice. It was the one thing. Yeah. And as he was getting his uh, older, his voice didn't deteriorate. With a lot of um, vocalists, you can hear that their voices get shot when they get older. Um, mm. Don't think it's happened to Jagger, but there, there, there are a lot of vocalists. As they get older, their voices do actually um, deteriorate, uh, not through their own fault. It's probably just age or whatever it is. Some yeah. people can still sing. But you know? also, when you look at his tour schedule, it's insane. So the strain on his voice, you know, he was doing something ridiculous, numbers per year and for an extended period, from like the end of 60s you know, to his death. He was being he was being absolutely rinsed, and it was show after show back in the studio. So the effect on his voice, you're, you're right, his voice should have degraded further than it probably did do. Somehow his voice stayed true until the end, which is interesting. The seventeen, I think it was the seventy two movie, the way it is. Mm -hmm. There's some footage in there where he's singing with his backing singers. Um, was it Blossoms or Jordanaires or did you have? No, no, no. It was the um, it was the male and female singers that he had. Mm -hmm. You know, the gospel stuff, it wasn't yep. the Jordanaires. Mm -hmm. And they were all great singers, yet still his voice is still above all of that. That, that, yeah. that that's the most incredible yeah. thing. His voice is above all of that. And um, I think it's absolutely unique. Um, absolutely unique, unique, unique voice um, yeah. and performer. And um, going back to the collaborations before we go on to... We, we, we're going to look at five songs shortly. But when we look at collaborations... If he would have stayed alive, um, we sort of think we, we were talking before um, we started this this morning. We were talking when you you think of the array of talent um, after he died, and he, he you know he could have even duets. Would he have done a track with Freddie Mercury? You know, oh. you, you know, would he done that? I would imagine he would have done something with Prince. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Michael Jackson, not so sure, um, but. We can both, I mean, you mentioned a few people this morning. Yeah, yeah. well, this is, I think, you know, like you said, you mentioned particularly, I think, um, with Prince, potentially. Uh, we, we mentioned Paul McCartney, being, being, McCartney. A mass, being the Beatles, being a massive fan of Elvis. There was an interesting story of when those two met, and Elvis said, if all you're going to do is stare at me, I'm going to go to bed. Because the Beatles were that in awe of him. They were just like, like, like fans. They were. Led Zeppelin, who turned oh. up at one of his gigs and he yeah. announced on stage... Um, I think it's one of his live albums or something. It might be one of the shows where Led, Led Zeppelin are here. I'm not going to do an Elvis impression. But it's like Led Zeppelin are in tonight or whatever. And they met him afterwards. And yeah. you'll find somewhere online Robert Plant talking about it. Yeah. Um, would he have Would he have sung with Adele? You know, that, that that that's another one. Yeah. Um, 
I couldn't imagine Adele turning somebody like Elvis down. I mean, obviously this is all, you know, uh, fictitious or whatever, yeah. but it's a great thing to sort of think about what would, you know, who would he have, you know, collaborated with? Would he have collaborated with Tupac? You know, as mad yeah. as it sounds. Oh, El- you know, there was that song about Elton John and the Tupac kind of you know, yeah. remix. So definitely Scope, I think. I think he's such an attraction. Anybody, any sort of management would jump on him, regardless of whatever crossover it is. You know, there's been a real contrast of kind of genres mixing up recently as well. And Elvis, where his voice is so timeless, um, I think, you know, there's definitely money to be made from a business perspective. Um, True. And, yeah, I mean, Elvis and Adele, two, two powerhouses, you know, that, you know, you know, Elvis and Ed Sheeran, he'd definitely jump on if Elvis was about. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I don't think there'd be many people who would say I wouldn't want to work with him, mm-hmm. um, even in this day and age. Um, so... It's quite, um, it's quite interesting that we um, um, have brought this subject up. Mm-hmm. So any of your thoughts on that would be absolutely um, fantastic. Who would be, you know, who, who would be a really good collaboration? The dream collaboration for Elvis, yeah. yeah. Well, who, who would you guys want to see? It, yeah. could be, so it could be left field, it could be anything. We're really curious because, like we said, he can sing the phone book. So. I agree. I agree. And um, we... Um, it's just endless, and I mean, we could talk about this all week, you know, like it's just, you know, who he could collaborate with and what kind of music that um, he would have done. Interestingly, going back to the, um, before we just go on to the five, we talk about the five tracks, the I Will Always Love You thing is mm-hmm. really interesting because I, um, those of you online, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the last few years when he was in Vegas, I think even in the way it's his movie, um, I believe that in the backing vocalist section of his backing band was Sissy Houston, Whitney Houston's mum, mm-hmm. was in the band. And they were just, you know, outrageously good singers. Um, yeah. Would he have sung with Whitney? Yeah. Especially the latter stuff, not the first half of the 80s. Yeah. You know, the 80s stuff, but maybe the 90s. Um, yeah, the 90s stuff. Um, yeah. Would Elvis have got involved with Pearl Jam or Soundgarden? Oh, that would have been a real... Rage Against the Machine. But, um, you know, interestingly, this actually is a slight segue. This whole idea of the machine. So Elvis become obsessed with collecting police badges, I read, okay? He right. loved collecting police. He loved the police. He loved the police badges. He, um, he really wanted uh, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs badge. He wanted to be a, a narcotics agent in his mind. So he wrote a letter to Richard Nixon as president at the time. Obviously, it was alcohol and drug fuel this sort of letter but he says he's seen he he he's seen the hippies and he's seen um like black like panthers and all these groups he says and they see me as an ally and he sees the damage that drugs are doing to the youth of america and he wants to use his spare time to go and speak to these people to help steer them onto the right path and um he said he said it must be kept a secret between me and you i don't want them knowing that i'm on your side otherwise it's going to ruin the effect but I want to go and do this. All I would need would be a badge for the Bureau of uh, Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. So he met Richard Nixon and he got his badge. And he, he said the part of the ploy was he's scared of the effect that the Beatles are having on the youth of America, which is ironic considering a lot of that was being said about him when he first got big. But all of this sort of crazy story, he lied to Nixon. Just, well, not lied, but he made up the story just so he could get this badge. I do know the full story about that. I've seen the pictures of him yeah. with Nixon in the... Um... You know, in the White House. Yeah. So I, I, I've seen those pictures. Yeah. Um, well, that was on my story, come because it mentioned of Rage Against the Machine, and he mentions how, how these groups are calling, you know, like America, the establishment. And he says, I love America. It's given me everything I've ever got today. And I want to I wanna help protect America. I want to I go and speak in my spare time. Don't tell anybody. Just it'll be a thing between me and you. All, all I need to do this will be a badge. It's interesting as well. You've, you've brought up a really good point there, because... Uh, when Barack Obama invited people to play at the White House, mm-hmm. um, and it was a array of people, it could be um, Aretha, uh, yep. yeah, Aretha Franklin, Bonnie Raitt, it could be all these kind of people. Um, the um, the platform below that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, would Elvis have done that? Well, of course he would have done. You know, absolutely. Would have been. Which brings on to the last bit, the last bit of this section before mm-hmm. we go on to our five, is. Would Elvis have done Live Aid? Ooh. Would he have done the Nelson Mandela gig? Mm-hmm. Would he have done Live Earth yep. and Live 8 um, mm-hmm. in the Millennium? 
would he have done any of those big festivals? And because he couldn't tour because of his manager, Interpol, mm -hmm. uh, everybody, everybody knows the story, he uh, couldn't leave um, the US mm -hmm. after when he joined the army and he did the gig in Hawaii, mm -hmm. he couldn't tour the rest of the world. He wasn't allowed to. I'm absolute. I think we're both. In, uh, would you agree that he would have toured the world? I mean, oh, absolutely. And, and he very much wanted to. He knew he had fans like in England. The records were selling in Europe. His records were selling, and they're really keen to see him. And all of that Beatle, not Beatle mania, all the Elvis mania he got in, you know, America would have been like times ten because by the time he finally come to the UK and the rest of the world, it'd have been insane. And he, he was very aware of, I think, his reach. He was doing well in the charts everywhere else, and he wanted to tour. And partly, you know, Parker did promise him tours, and then made excuses up as to why you couldn't do this and why you couldn't do that. Do you think... I, I mean, I remember as a kid seeing, quite a few times, seeing ACDC, and then... Name drop, casually. Then, <laughs> then, used to get people that used to turn up, that used to dress up as Angus, the guitar player, mm -hmm. but they'd have, a, they'd have an SG or a Gibson SG copy mm -hmm. um, in the audience. So would Elvis, you know, would Elvis impersonators go to um, a gig... Um, dressed up as one of the stages of Elvis, you know, Ooh. either, you know, the truck driver, uh, the yeah. film star, uh, the 68 comeback special, yeah. or the 70s, um, you know, the 70s glitter, you know, kind of... Um, Clinging on to it a little bit, kind of jumpsuit. throwing out of yeah, shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. And what country would you like to see in Elvis? Well, obviously, biased. I'd love to see him come to London, firstly. Would you? Yeah. I'd like to see him... I would like to have seen him play in Japan. Or because like you would get every, I think you yeah. would get every range of people dressing up. Yeah, as you know, in the whole because when you think of people that want to uh, be like that, there is no other artist probably um, that has probably lasted like that. Where where, where even children want to be like Elvis. You know, women would like, like to dress like Elvis from any of those eras. Mm -hmm. You see David Bowie. You know, you know, the, 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 there's a you know Bowie years later. People didn't get a Bowie gig dressed up as uh, Ziggy Stardust. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting point. Yeah. Um, and you out there will know more, probably, than those of you that, that are like that will probably be able to answer, why is that? Um, and it's probably, I don't think it's going to change. There's been movies made about him. Yeah. Um, 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 there's the Nicolas Cage film. Mm -hmm. Um about Las Vegas. It's always Las oh, Vegas and yes. Elvis. There's so many films. You and know, there's Finding Graceland as well. Yeah, yeah there's, 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 there's films that, you know, with Elvis impersonators. Yeah. You rarely see that with any other, um, um, well, we use the word broadly, but pop stars or rock stars yeah. or whatever, you know, like, you rarely see it. It's interesting because he seemed to, I read one, uh, it was a book I read and um, I think it's called Being Elvis and he mentioned that for, even when he was at school, Elvis would wear quite a flamboyant clothes because he wanted to be like a mega star, a superstar, and he understood that he had to look the part as well. Um, so part of being like a rock, a rock, a mega star at the time was having the look. People needed to look at you and think, "Wow, he looks like cooler than me. He looks like a real star." So even at school, sometimes the kids would take the mick out of him for the way he used to dress. But he would always, you know, his big sideburns, his kind of flary trousers. He would always dress a bit differently, and that then came through with the jumpsuits. And he really kind of understood, I think, the importance of his, of his iconography. And you know, since then, like I said, for me growing up not being a massive fan of him growing up, there's more of the jumpsuits and the hair and the act, all of that were kind of made up my vision of Elvis and what I knew of him because, you know, everybody recognises the jumpsuits, whatever colour or very stage, it's kind of, it's become part and parcel of Elvis, is the look, which like you said, a lot of pop stars kind of don't have the, the icon, um, that's an iconic look about them. Maybe Freddie Mercury uh, and maybe Michael Jackson, well, Michael Jackson yeah. has gone as well, but if they were still alive, maybe they would come into that, mm -hmm. that category as well, yeah. Um, be interesting in years to come with Madonna. That 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 would also be that would yeah. also be really interesting yeah. to see um, fans that will take the certain different commit what I call uh, chameleon images. You know, where mm -hmm. where very very few artists yeah. have the capability of being able to change and move on mm -hmm. um, from where they originally were. Uh, and it's got it's definitely got something to do with longevity. You know, longevity basically. Yeah how some artists last a lifetime and some don't. Some don't have to change because they're really, really good. Yeah. Um, that normally happens in bands and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so 
It is. It's it, it, it's it's a really interesting subject. We'll have all the stuff uh, put up so you know you can um, engage and put you know put stuff in. And the what we'll do is uh, those of you that are going to um, upload your versions of your favourite Elvis, what you thought Elvis would sing or whatever, and then we are going to um, find someone who's going to basically whether we think is not the best one, but... Something different. Something different. Um, we'll get you in, and in the meantime, in, uh, during the series, we'll announce uh, in that competition what we'll be doing with that person, basically. Could be recording, could be filming, it could be something. Big plans. But it's a big one, and um, we've, we've, we've worked it out, and we'll announce that later on. So we now get to what we've been talking about which is our five tracks yeah i'll kick the ball if you don't Absolutely. mind i'll kick Get off rolling. my fir- the first one i came up came up with was which was after 1977 was from i believe i think it was uh, it was either rocky 4 or rocky 5 the sylvester stallone movies and it's living in america by mm-hmm. james brown um it would have been interesting because i think that um just before he died um he was up for the part for A Star Is Born. Chris Christopherson mm-hmm. took it instead. Yep. Um, I don't know what happened there. Maybe he, he probably wasn't well enough to act anymore. That was still a huge hit film and no discredit to Chris Christopherson. Yep. You know, fabulous job or whatever. But after that, and in the 1980s, listening to Living in America, um, James Brown, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um Fantastic song, really works in the film. But as you were saying before about the USA, you know, he was very patriotic. Yeah. Um, Elvis. I think if he was, he, if he would have been offered that, I think he would have done it. And also the other, uh, the other interesting thing about that song is, I say allegedly, but I think it's absolutely true. The late great Stevie Ray Vaughan plays guitar, plays the guitar solo on that song. I think it was mid eighties when that song came out. Um, from the movie and it was huge and I've always I mean, James Brown absolutely brilliant fantastic um, release you know that mm-hmm. he did with it and I've always thought well who else could have really done that I mean if it would have been like um, a front man from a rock band it was ooh, you know yeah. thinking about Elvis doing it it would have been um, well it would have suited him down to a T I think yeah. it was everything you believed and lived for you know living in America and just to go back to the point about him almost being cast in A Star Is Born, it's a real shame, really, because that would have been the one role he's been looking for for so long, that sort of serious sort of role, finally, yeah. to get some credibility. So it's a real shame that didn't work out, but yeah, living in America, absolutely, yeah. would have been, a, I think, a great shout. Yeah, and when you see the video, you actually see the video from the song, uh, from the movie, um, it looks like it's from a live show, although, yeah. you know, they're, they're obviously miming in a theatre or whatever. I wonder if he would have done it live. Wow. You know, on stage, yeah, with his band, with that great band, with James Burton, who's still with us. You know, yep. and a lot of them are actually still with us, and they're still playing. So that's my that's my one at five. Okay, um, what about your, your your one? Your the next one, George. Number four. Um, so for me, I think uh, we're gonna. I would probably say, "Are you mine?" by the Arctic Monkeys. Like kind of big rock and roll sound, Great which, choice. yeah, which he could you know set out doing in Las Vegas, do big theaters with. Um, Alex Turner in the video is doing a bit of an Elvis impersonation himself. He's got the little like, hair kind of greased back, the glasses and leather jacket. Um, and I just think that big rock and roll style, that, you know, powerful voice he had. I really think you know the drums that he loved so much. I think that definitely would have been him. Um, and he had a great band, so it would have been a real spectacle to see if he did it in Vegas or somewhere around, somewhere around the world. It would have been a fantastic career move as well because Mm -hmm. the Arctic Monkeys were one of the first um, music acts Mm -hmm. uh, to embrace the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, No doubt about that. Um, It's 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 basically been it's recorded history, and that would have opened Elvis up to a whole new um, generation of people as well. Um, I think it's a really clever, um, a really clever choice of not only a song, but a collaboration if he would have worked with them. Mm-hmm. They would have been a great song to cover. Yeah. Yeah, I just think that big rock sound, you know, I think he, he liked, you know, to show off his range and he could do the ballads, he could do the spirituals, but I think that big rock and roll sound, I know in a big theatre, people, you know, like like thousands of people watching it, moved a full of the crowd, the energy would have been through the roof probably. And um, 
I think the big drum intro, you know, he'd stand, he'd have stood there posturing, the big drum intro and the guitars come in. You know, it'd have been signature Elvis, I think. Good choice. Good choice. If you want to record that, um, you know, or you just want to do a version of it with a guitar or whatever, mm-hmm. fantastic. We'd, we'd, we'd love to hear it. Um, okay. Number three is Uptown Funk. Great choice. Bruno Mars. Um, he would have been great doing that mm-hmm. and would have been sensational performing it as well, possibly in the version that it is. Yeah, I think very similar. I think you could just see him posturing on stage. I think the flow of it was so Elvis. Um, it, 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 even in the music video, it, it's in Vegas, parts in Vegas. It's so Elvis. I know the whole the whole kind of the whole vibe of the song, the feel of it. It's Elvis having a great time. Um, and it, it would have shown the new side to him potentially. Building up and building up and building up yeah. as the track does. Absolutely. Um, Yes, with the same producer would have Not been really, yeah would have been really interesting as well. Well, yeah. it would have to be. You yeah, know, basically, I think I, I I think that one is um, basically a no brainer. I really think and Mark Ronson and Elvis Presley that would be something to that would be odd, see wouldn't it? Him. Not yeah. odd, but that would be that that would be it's as something. A, I say producers queuing up to work with him mm-hmm. would um, in this, even in this day and age would be um, quite extraordinary. Um, yeah, that, that's really good with producers. So um, there's two that we've already come up with that would work with him. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I that would have loved to have worked with him. Um, so number two, number two, I think it's got to be "Believe" by Cher. Elvis on auto tune, take him in, <laughs> take him into the 21st century. I think that would have been a real. You know, I'm not sure if the Colonel was still around. He would have agreed to it. You know, what's all this auto tune you're talking about? You know, it's, it's not going to work. But I just think I think the chorus suits his, suits his voice anyway, like kind of or vocal. But Elvis and Alter Tune, you know, the man was you know he adapted throughout his career. He could sing anything, so why not? You know, he was, we probably would have done a version with that one as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah true. Yeah. We definitely would have done. He could have done a really stripped back version, almost like a spiritual version. But Elvis of Alter Tune, um, you can just hear that in your yeah. head, you especially, especially the chorus, which I think really suits his style, like big sort of vocal. Um, and, you know, same again, a lot of songs I think about he might have done, I think about him performing them on stage because he was a real showman. And that chorus would have just erupted the place. My yeah. nan would have loved it. Yeah. 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 yeah All the tracks that we've really. mentioned so far, mm-hmm. that one. Um, so going back to my nan before, I was just talking about my nan, she would have absolutely mm-hmm. flipped over that. Yeah, yeah. She's always spot a number one record as well. Yeah. She would have said, um, boy, that's what she used to call me, you know. Heard this boy like that, yeah. You know, <laughs> Elvis doing Believe. Um, it's a number one record anyway. Yeah. Yeah, she would have loved that. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing with that, with that um, song, was when that came out, it was the first song that really properly used auto tune. Mm-hmm. And the record companies denied it, but they, da- uh, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. And since then, again, an- another topic which we'll cover. It's uh, uh, allegedly or sadly saved them huge amounts of money. Mm-hmm. You, we both know, you know, you, you know what would happen without auto tune. Sometimes it would take days and days and days to record a vocal. Yeah. Um, but there are some. Yeah. I mean, there are some vocalists that can sing uh, vocals one off. Interestingly enough, we just come away from Elvis for a second. Mm-hmm. Um, Whitney Houston, uh, Dolly Parton's "I Will Always Love You," which we spoke about earlier on. Um, Again, uh, folklore says that it was one take and it was a demo recording. David Foster oh, wow. produced it. And uh, Clive Davis, uh, who managed her and looked after her and nurtured her or whatever, um, he sent him a DAT. Those of you that remember the little mm-hmm. DAT master tapes, um, sent him a DAT and said, Look, what do you think? This is from the film. And his story went that he didn't, um, couldn't understand that in the movie. He didn't get artistically involved with it, which he did with all the other stuff that she'd done. There wasn't any music in the film, and mm. Kevin Costner had said you should record this track, and David Foster did it with her. So David Foster thought that he'd sent Clive Davis a rough, mixed demo mm-hmm. of I Will Always Love You, and uh, Clive Davis phoned him up and said, uh, this master that you've sent me is absolutely brilliant. Master means it's ready for release, basically. Mm-hmm. It's not a demo. And they had an argument on the phone, and David Foster said, don't you dare release it, um, because the guitar's not right on it. Funny enough, when you do listen to it, the guitar is, so you know, whatever, and the strings could be up a bit. All the usual things that a producer would say. Mm-hmm. 
or whatever. And Clive Davis apparently walked around with it in his pocket for two months, the Dunnet, and then just went ahead and released it. And uh, great story. Forty odd million copies later. Insane. Uh, yeah. And for Dolly Parton to turn down that song to give away some of her, um, or maybe all of her publishing rights, mm-hmm. who knows, just so that Elvis would have recorded it and just been given yeah. possibly a large sum of money at the time, yeah. stood up and said no. Yeah. Uh, and then 25 years later, oh no, it's about 20 years later, um, it becomes one of the biggest selling recorded songs of all time, and so was the soundtrack, The Bodyguard. Oh, it's a really Incredible. interesting point, because you said about it not being ready. Elvis was notorious for He didn't mind mistakes on the, on his record, because when, when they said, let's redo it, he'd say, why? You're going to lose all the film, going to ruin you know, the energy of a song. So he wouldn't have minded those sort of mistakes on the track, because the energy and the feel was all there, and that was what it was all about, you know. He said there's been takes where there's been things that have been off, but he doesn't want to you know, ruin, kill the vibe and the mood he's got, so it would go hand in hand, really. Yeah, very, very, very... Um story sort of goes around in full circle on that. And as I say, love to hear the demo if it does actually exist mm-hmm. uh, and it's not a legend or whatever um, that actually exists. And now we're going to go to number one. And um, it was my choice and it had to be... Um, we, we both talked about big songs mm-hmm. and um, it, had, it had to be a big song. Yeah. And really, this was about four or five years um, after... Um, he passed away and it's from David Geffen's Dream Girls. Great shout. Jennifer Holiday, and I'm mm-hmm. telling you I'm not going. And the incredible thing about that was he would have given it his all yeah. uh, vocally. Absolutely. You know, it would, it would just be insane, you know, even just being in the studio and that was recorded, you know, he it, it would have really laid into it in a signature style, of course, that power you know, the range, it would just be perfect. He, 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 he would probably would have sung it with his heart. We looked through so much, um, um, or so many songs, you know, the, you know, the big power ballads. Mm-hmm. We looked at so many um, 80s and 90s and millennium, big, big songs. But you may well come up with um, some great ideas um, that may even blow away... Um, that particular song. Um, there's really not a lot that can be, a, a lot that can actually be said about the Jennifer Holiday song, apart from um, it does everything. You know, it's the power ballad, it's a storyteller. Mm. Um, it's timeless. It is. The vocal delivery is mm-hmm. on it. Um, and it's a karaoke favourite, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everybody wants to sing it, but not very many people can actually um, deliver it. Yeah. Um, it's a big one. Like you said, after a few drinks, you get on the karaoke, we're all going to give it a go. But, you know, and very few can deliver. Very, very few can deliver. Yeah, it's a tough song. But as we said before earlier on, he could sing the phone book. He would have been able to do it. And I think he would have wanted to do it. Um, mm. So that's at one. So we've we've put five forward. Yeah. Um, my actual favourite is your choice, which is... Uh, believe believe that's my favorite very interesting wouldn't it yeah. um, especially like you mentioned because he, he didn't mind mistakes would he have been accepting of autotune on his track as well is in a whole other debate but it's a massive track you know share absolute classic of the 90s and uh, if elvis could take a lot on it would be surreal yeah and in fact really the song brought the air the 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 um the ambience of that song brought it into the millennium. Mm-hmm. You know, to, I think it was ninety. Was it ninety eight? I think it was somewhere around there. Yeah, it was, it was the late nineties. It was the late nineties, but actually brought it into, um, you know, into the, um, you know, recording into the millennium mm-hmm. and how things have changed. As I say, auto tune. We'll, we'll go into that. That's a whole other we'll, can we'll, of worms. Yeah, that's another. That's another podcast entirely, yeah. right? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, um, what we'd like you to do is. Um, We'd like you to, um, those of you that want to go for it, um, it doesn't matter if it's it's well recorded or it's badly recorded or it's just a cappella on your own um, or there's there's two or three of you, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But as a, you know, you know, as a, as a tribute and, and um, a really good um, Elvis impersonation or whatever, you know, or whatever you want to do or whatever, that would be great. Um, so. Um, we are going to put it up on um, 
The competition will be up on the website, which is mm -hmm. www.realityjukebox.com. It will be up on our relevant Facebook and uh, Facebook pages. Yep. And if you don't want to upload anything, but you just want to put a clip up of yourself uh, impersonating Elvis or whatever up on Twitter, you know, 30 seconds or whatever it is, that would be great as well. Yeah. Okay. So, um, this is our first podcast. Thanks for watching, uh, George and myself. Thank you, George. Thank you, Ross. And this is Reality Jukebox, and we'll see you on the next one. Last thing to say, Elvis has left the building. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you.